Hello everyone, and welcome to this talk about Apache Druid in ApacheCon Asia 2021's Big Data Track. Today I'll be talking about the storage and query engine in Apache Druid, which is a real-time database. First off, who am I? My name is Gian Merlino, and I'm a committer and PMC chair at the Apache Druid project. I'm also a co-founder and CTO at Imply, a company that is based around the Apache Druid project. First off, quickly an agenda of what we're gonna talk about today. First, I'm gonna start with an introduction to Apache Druid, talking about the basics, why Apache Druid was created and how it fits into the data ecosystem. Then deployment patterns, how people commonly use Druid. Then we're gonna go inside Druid. This is the meat of the talk, talking about the storage and query engine. Then we're gonna do a brief demo and then talk about how you can try out Druid at home. So first off, an introduction to Apache Druid. Well, this is a picture of what we think about when we think about Druid. We think about a big rocket, we think about a query engine that's fast and powerful and goes super far, super quickly. But what is Druid really? I think if we're just being honest with ourselves, Druid is a big fancy calculator. It's something that you put on a bunch of servers and it adds up numbers really, really quickly. Why might you want to do that? Yeah, so in the Druid project, we think that uh, the reason you want to add numbers up really, really quickly and lots and lots of servers is because you want to put your analytics in motion. And to me, that means four things. Uh, the first thing is interactive queries. You want sub-second OLAP queries. OLAP is online analytical processing. It's things like uh, mostly read-only queries used to produce visualizations, aggregate analysis, that kind of thing. You're generally not retrieving individual points and you're not doing lots of uh, updates and transactions and that kind of thing. We want it to be highly scalable, so we want to support massive data volumes, a lot of query concurrency, lots of ingestion throughput. We want it to be real-time, so we want the ability to ingest in true real-time. Now, Druid does support both real-time and batch. I'll talk a bit about this in the later section about deployment patterns, but we do support true real-time, and that is important for a lot of use cases. Next off, uh, finally, we want it to be cost effective. We want to have these fast queries at low cost, which means we want to have really good unit economics on a single server. And I'll talk more about that uh, in the section about how the query engine is built. So, like I said, Druid is designed to power analytical applications. On the left-hand side here, I have an example of that. This is implied pivot. And I'm showing it in animations, which is a way that I like to show implied pivot. And the reason for that is because it's meant to be a tool for interacting with your data, going through a flow, asking questions, getting answers, repeating that process. And this is something that Druid really shines at. On the right-hand side, we have other third-party apps that are designed to work with Druid. Um, Looker and Tableau, a couple of commercial applications, Apache Superset, another Apache project. And uh, you can also build your own applications. Druid speaks SQL, and lots of people have built their own apps using, uh, using Druid and Druid's SQL API. There's tens of thousands of people using Druid in the world. Here's just four of them. The first one, Netflix, uses Druid for real-time insights to ensure high quality. Mopub, a Twitter subsidiary, queries terabytes of data in seconds with Druid. Salesforce using Druid to deliver high quality insights and Airbnb enabling analytics using Druid as a core part of their analytics platform. Some numbers from Imply customers. So across the Imply customer base, and of course all Imply customers are also Druid users, um, petabytes of data under management, thousands of daily active users, millions of rows per second ingested, and all this with 90 percentile query time less than one second and a 99 percentile query time of less than two seconds. So the system, this is just to say, it really does work, it really does scale, it really does achieve the goals that we want, which is to deliver these super fast queries at this really impressive scale. But don't just take it from me. Uh, there's independent benchmarks too. Here's one that was done a couple years ago comparing Druid with the latest versions of Presto and Hive at the time, uh, showing Druid be over 100 times faster than Hive and even over 20 times faster than Presto. Um, and how does it do it? Uh, well, we'll get into that in a bit, but um, hopefully this is uh, helping motivate some interest in, in learning about how Druid does these things. <clears throat> Before we get to how Druid actually works and how it achieves the speed that it does, I want to talk about some deployment patterns. How do people actually use it in practice? So the first pattern is a streaming pattern. So what we have here is on the left-hand side, we have data sources represented by these little stars. 
going into our streaming delivery system. In this case, I'm using Apache Kafka, another great Apache project. Then we may do some manipulations on them, enhancements, stream joins, that kind of thing. That can happen in Kafka streams. That is optional. Uh, you can load data directly without uh, transformation of that into Jira if you don't need it. But if you do need it, Kafka streams is a great tool. Um, and then you're loading that into Druid, your real-time database. And then off of Druid, you're powering your presentation layer. Um, and again, here I have these, these uh, animations of the presentation layer that we build, uh, but you can build your own. You can use Apache Superset, all these things um, are presentation layers that would work off of Druid. Uh, another pattern here, um, if you're less real-time kind of setup and you're more into data lakes and you are into Kafka, um, again, you can have data sources coming into a data lake as file-based storage. And like I mentioned earlier, Jira does have the ability to read files out of a data lake. Uh, and the same presentation works on that. Um, just as fast in terms of how the queries work. So there's no difference there in, in query speed. Of course, the data will be somewhat less fresh if it comes from a data lake. If it comes from a system like Apache Kafka, uh, the data will be immediately updated. If it's coming from a data lake, it's going to be updated by doing batch ingest in the background. Another pattern, you can actually combine both Kafka and a data lake together. This is a, a Kafka plus data lake pattern. Um, why might you want to do this? Well, the big reason is because you might want to do direct loads from Kafka into Druid normally, but then have the ability to backfill from a data lake uh, for loading older data that's not in Kafka, uh, for loading maybe certain tables that aren't available in Kafka, maybe for patching up old data that you want to fix, uh, do updates to, and those updates are not reflected in your Kafka topic. So this is a, a common pattern that mixes sort of the best of both worlds, the ability to get that historical data out of a lake, but also to get real-time data out of Kafka. One cool feature of Jira is you can do both of these loads into the same table. Uh, finally, another pattern is to deploy Jira side by side with the query engine. And you might wonder, why do this? You know, why don't I just run everything with Druid? And the reason for that is because Druid is super fast. It's designed to be super fast, super scalable, super economical, all that. Not quite as flexible, though, as a query engine. So these query engines are going to support kinds of queries like fact-to-fact -fact joins and, and things like that um, that Druid does not support today. All right, so we talked a bit about uh, intro to Druid, you know, how do people use Druid out there, deployment patterns, how it fits into the data ecosystem. Now I want to get actually inside Druid, look under the hood and see how it works. So first off, how does a cluster come together? This is a good way of thinking about the high level picture. I'm going to start in the middle with the data layer. So the data layer, if you look on the right hand side, there's this little purple box. Um, what's coming into there is streaming and batch ingestion. Um, like I said, we do support both of those methods. If you are doing streaming data, that is going to be immediately queryable, and that's where you get that real time from. Um, either way, whether you're doing streaming or batch, we are periodically going to push things down into deep storage. Deep storage is going to be either a cloud object store or HDFS or a NFS file or something like that. It's going to be shared storage across all the machines. Now we don't use this for queries. So um, what the way that works is you look at the arrow to the left uh, coming out of deep storage back into the data layer. Uh, that is actually happening uh, in the background. So we do a background prefetch of data. So it's hot, already ingested, cached locally on the data servers. We actually don't um, hit deep storage in the query path. We only hit it in the background to pre-populate data for queries. So this enables a lot of speed. This enables a lot of great performance. Um, and then uh, finally, the query layer above the data layer uh, is initiating queries, receiving SQL, planning SQL, and then merging results from the data layer. So the data layer in most situations is going to do the majority of the actual computational work. And the query layer is just going to be combining partial results from different data servers and returning them back to the user. So I mentioned the word segment a few times, and you saw this little picture of segments. And I want to talk about that. Um, in Druid, we have a concept called segments. It's a heavily optimized storage format. New segments are created continuously as data is ingested. They are immutable once they're created, but they can be dropped, replaced, or combined. We call that sort of combination compaction. And generally, each segment is going to have one to five million rows. So even a single table in Druid can be uh, hundreds or even millions of segments. So diving deeper into segments, the next thing I want to talk about is the segment format. 
So here is an example segment. This segment has five columns in it, time, artist, city, price, and count. And this represents a ticket sale for a concert sort of data set. So we have the artists that are selling tickets, the city that those artists are performing in, the price the ticket was sold for, how many tickets were sold is the count, and the time is the time that the sale occurred. Um, so that's, a, that's a, about this data set. Um, the first thing I want to call attention to is the time column. So Druid uh, does require a time column. We call it the primary timestamp. Uh, we have a lot of data management operations in Druid that are time oriented. So you can patch data and tables by time. Um, we have a very rapid global time filter. So we have a lot of optimizations around time. It's great for event oriented data. Um, doesn't have to be strictly time series data. Um, can just be events and things happening. So the time column we store as a long, uh, so a 64 bit integer. And um, because we are columnar storage format, we're gonna store all the timestamps together. Uh, which you'll see is going to be important later. Uh, next up is the artist. So you see that, that the string column is actually a little bit more interesting than the time column because it has three parts. So the first part is the data section, and you'll see there's eight records here, uh, which match the eight records in the time column. And actually match every, every column here has eight records. That because, that's because this segment has eight rows in it. So what this is saying is that the first three rows have artist zero, the next two have artist one, and then the final three have artist number two. The dictionary section tells us what those are. It tells us zero is Justin, one is Kesha, and two is Miley. So this dictionary coding is actually a way for us to uh, sort of encode the data and, and compress it in a way. Um, and you'll see later as we uh, talk about how the query engine works, how we operate on the data in its encoded and compressed form. Uh, finally, we have an index for the string column, and the index is also stored compressed. We also operate on the index in its compressed form. Uh, we're using a technique called Roaring Bitmaps for that. It's a great library. Go check it out. Um, anyway, the index has the same number of entries as the dictionary. So you see here, there's three entries matching the dictionary three entries, and they're one-to-one -one correspondence with dictionary entries. So the first element here, the first index uh, entry here is for Justin, the second is for Kesha, and the third is for Miley. Finally, there is a couple other long columns. Um, these long columns are actually stored in the same way as the time column, although at query time, you would query them a little bit differently. You would query them as integers as opposed to timestamps, although under the hood, they're stored the same way. All right, so having talked about that, the next thing I wanna talk about is actually running through a query and showing what a query would look like. Um, for that, I'm gonna start with this relatively simple query. It's a select city and sum of price from sales, where artist equals Justin, group by city. So this is just saying, um, get all the cities uh, where Justin sold some tickets, and then total up the total price of all those tickets. So a relatively simple query. Let's look at how it runs. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to resolve the where clause. So where artist equals Justin. We're going to start that off by going to the dictionary. and. One important fact of the dictionary in Druid is that we store them in alphabetical order, which means we can do a binary search to find any value. We don't have to fully scan the dictionary if we're looking for a single value. So we do a binary search here, and we see that Justin is zero. Next, we go into the index, and remember that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence there between the dictionary and the index. So we see that um, Justin corresponds to this first index entry, which is a, a bitmap for rows 0, 1, and 2. So now we know that um, the first three rows are, uh, contain, contain that value, Justin. We could have also figured this out from looking at the data section, because we see 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2. But doing it in the dictionary and index is faster. Next off, we are going to go to the city and price columns, and we're going to walk them. Um, we're only going to look at the rows that we know match the index, 0, 1, and 2. In this case, they're all together. Um, although if we did have a case where they were not all contiguous, we would actually do a skipping scan. We wouldn't read every value out of these columns. We only read the ones that match that filter. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the city column. And actually when we're doing a group by like this, the algorithm that we select is going to be based on what we're grouping by. So here we're grouping by city, which is a string. Um, if the number of distinct values is known and 
relatively low, we're going to use an array, which we are going to do here because we know that there's three distinct values. So we will use an array here. If the number of distinct values was unknown, maybe because it's a function of multiple columns, or if it's known and high, uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to use a hash table instead of an array. Um, at any rate, so we're going through the city column, we're using the dictionary codes as keys, uh, as indexes into the array. So for uh, when we encounter a two and an 1800 for price, we put an 1800 in the cell two on the um, aggregation array. Then we see a one and we put a 2912 for price in the cell for one. And then we see a two and we put the 1953 in the cell for two. So that, that we're operating on these dictionary codes without having to know what strings they are yet. The next thing that we do is now we have to know what strings they are. We've done the aggregation. We throw away the zero because the aggregation result was null. We didn't encounter any zeros. And then we look up the other two um, dictionary codes, one and two, and we find that they are LA and SF. And so now we have the answer for this segment. Of course, there's going to be many other segments. And the partial results for those many other segments are going to be merged in a tree-like fashion. So first, all the results for the same data server are merged together, different segments on the same server, and then different servers in the same cluster are merged together in this hierarchical merging tree. Um, but let's look at let's look at how we actually did this query. We did it in a very economical way, and so this query can execute very rapidly. Um, we did first a binary search in the dictionary, and then we did a random access into the index, and then we did potentially a, a skipping scan of two columns. And in this case, we didn't even need to use a hash table for the aggregation. We were able to use an array instead of a hash table. So these are all very inexpensive operations. And so that's, this, this query can be executed very, very quickly, even if this segment has millions of rows in it. Um, and this is really the secret to, to performance, is getting the most out of the machine by doing very little, doing as little as possible, taking advantage of the fact that we can have these indexes, we can have these dictionaries, um, we can sort of skip around the segment and read different pieces. So this is something that works best when the data is local and when it's on either in memory or on uh, solid state drives that provide fast random access. That's one of the reasons that we prefetch data rather than querying it out of deep storage. All right, so now that you've seen how Druid works under the hood, I want to show you what it looks like behind the wheel. So let's do a quick demo. So here I've got Druid running locally on my laptop. To load data from Kafka, I'm first going to go to load data over here at the top of the screen. Start a new spec. And I'm going to see a variety of data sources that I could load from. And so let me choose Apache Kafka. So one of my favorite demo data sets is a stream of edits being made on Wikipedia. That's a public data set, and I actually have it streaming live into a Kafka topic right now that's also running locally on my machine. So I'm going to type in my localhost 9092 Kafka server running on my laptop, and the topic name is Wikipedia. So the first thing I see is some sample data from the topic, just to let me know that it's been connected properly. That'll help me build a schema in Druid. Next, I click on parse data, and it's been detected as JSON format, which is correct. Everything looks good. So I'm going to go to the next screen. Here, this is the time parsing screen. Druid tables all have a primary timestamp column that is used for partitioning. And there's only one timestamp in this data set, so we're going to use this one. It's already selected, so I will click Next. This is the transform screen. In Druid, we can perform transforms at ingestion time, like regular expressions and arithmetic expressions. There's no need for that here. We're just going to load the data as is, so let's click Next. This is the filter screen. In Druid, we can perform filters at ingestion time, too. Uh, in this case, there's no need for that either. We want to load the entire data set, and so we're also going to go on to the next screen. Here's where we configure our schema. This is the schema builder. So in this demo, I'm going to use the defaults, which are just based on the types found in the sample data. Uh, for more advanced use cases, we might make changes to these types. We might add or remove columns, or we might even configure rollup, which is a way to build summary tables during ingestion time. On this screen, we choose partitioning granularity. 
And like I said, Druid uses the primary timestamp for partitioning, and uh, we decide how the partitioning is going to occur. I'm going to go with hour, which is typical for streaming data. Next on the screen, we have the ability to adjust tuning parameters like parallelism and replica count. Again, I'm going to stick with the defaults, but in a production situation, I would at least want to set up replication. Uh, here, finally, we choose a name for the data source. In Druid, we call tables data sources. And I'm going to keep this as Wikipedia. It's been filled in because that's the name of the Kafka topic, and by default, the name of the data source or table in Druid is the same as the name of the Kafka topic that you're reading from. Finally here, we see the JSON that will be posted to the Druid API to get the ingestion going. The Druid APIs are all JSON-based uh, as far as, in, as it relates to ingestion and administrative tasks. I could make some final edits here, but I don't need to. I'm going to click Submit and let's watch what happens. So this is the ingestion view. We can see up here in the supervisors section, there is a pending supervisor for the Wikipedia topic. Supervisors are in Druid what we refer to as supervised ingestion, and supervised ingestion refers to the concept that we are, uh, data is being continuously loaded from some external system, in this case Kafka. So I refresh this, it's now gone from pending to running, and let's see the task view. So when I refresh the task view, I can see a task has started. The task is going to actually read data. It will run for about an hour before publishing the data to deep storage and saving a checkpoint to Druid's metadata store. If you think back to that diagram from a few slides earlier, this is actually running on the indexer service. But even so, even though the data hasn't been published yet, it's still queryable immediately. So let's go check that out. This is Druid's query view where we can run SQL queries. So let's do a couple of simple queries. first query I'm doing is just a simple select star to see what data is in the table. Auto limit is selected, which means that this is not actually going to return the entire table, it's going to return the first 100 results. So I can see here that my data was actually ingested successfully uh, in the form that I expect. So that's great. And let's look at count. So I can see here that we've loaded a little over 200,000 messages. And actually, if I run this again, the count goes up because the data is continuously being loaded from Kafka into Druid. All right, so now that you've seen that, you can also try it at home. This is ApacheCon, everything here is open source. Great. So here's how you stay in touch with the Druid project. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. We're at Druid.io on Twitter. Uh, join the community. We're at druid.apache.org slash community. You can also download uh, Druid there. A little plug for Imply. You can get free online training by Imply at imply.io slash druid university. It's a bunch of videos we put together at Imply to help teach people uh, in the Druid community uh, some Druid concepts. And then finally, if you're interested in checking out the code or if you want to submit a pull request or get involved in development, uh, that development is happening on GitHub at uh, the Apache uh, slash druid repository. Thank you so much for coming and I hope you enjoyed the talk.